This is a production of Off the Hook Sports with Dave Hooker. Super excited to visit with Chris Landry today. I'm Dave Hooker and super excited to introduce a brand new advertiser and sponsor on board the Mattress Place. When it comes to the Mattress Place, you know that you have a huge, huge showroom with over 50 models, a 5,000 square foot showroom. It's the Mattress Place. It is very easy to find. It's on Chapman Highway. Go to mymattressplace.com, mymattressplace.com. All right, so we're rolling out of a Tennessee football weekend, and uh, Tennessee hosted several big-time uh, prospects. And we, we've spoken about this briefly, but the, I, I, I did want to revisit it just a little bit because I had an opportunity to hear some comments from Nico, the five-star quarterback out of California. And I'll tell you what, if he's recruiting half as hard as he says he is, he's doing a fantastic job for Tennessee. And I look back at the history of it. Tennessee picks up about four commitments right after he committed in March, and they pick up two when he's on campus this weekend. I do believe he's having a tangible effect on this class. Chris, am I wrong? No, I think he is. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to know behind the scenes, but, uh, it, it's either that or a coincidence in the fact that he's such a highly regarded quarterback and a, and kind of a, a beacon light of, hey, look, it's cool, it's chic to, to come to Knoxville again and, you know, getting other top players. When you're a top guy, these kids all know the names, even at other positions, who the best players are. When you have a guy like Nico come in, say he's an elite player and you're a really good player and you don't maybe have the – the notoriety you you it, you tend to listen and you tend to take that more to heart. So I think he's having a positive impact, and uh, certainly uh, with friends and my yoga uh, is is someone that he hopes to uh, to get in. But others um, that he's already got in, I think he's had an, an effect. You know, he's the best recruiters are your players and and uh, the players that are on your team. But certainly when you get a guy like that, I think he's having a big impact. And you talk about Francis, the offensive tackle out of IMG Academy, visited Tennessee this past weekend, and Tennessee looks to be in pretty good shape for him. We'll see. He's going to announce on July the 4th. Who are some of the best committed player slash recruiters that you've either been around or heard of? Now, some of this is going to be before social media, so the impact is probably a little, little lighter in those days. Uh, than being able just to reach out to me. But who are some of the guys you think best helped put together a class over, that were players over your years? Oh, you mean players that were on a team? Yes. Oh, guys. You know what? Here's the thing that's amazing. It's guys that I could mention that you would never even know their names. Sometimes it's not even I, – I mentioned great players have an impact because of their status. But the best recruiters, the best hosts, sometimes are the guys that they might be a backup that never sees the field. I've had walk-on types. Um, it, it, it's usually the guys that really have a keen understanding of the campus, the school, a bit of the history. It's very personable. The, the social atmosphere, you know, taking guys out and whatnot, showing them a good time. Um, you might call them social butterfly type guys. So it's those type of guys. And sometimes you, you can have a great player. Yes. You know, he's kind of a, to himself or whatever. He's not a great host, <laughs> but it really depends upon the player. Now I've had guys that, you know, I knew this guy wasn't a real, he was all into football and he wasn't into the nightlife. Well, I'd pair him with a guy that was like that. You know, and but most of the guys like to go and have a good time and see the nightlife. And sometimes that that the best players don't necessarily are the best nightlife guys. And sometimes it's some guy that, again that's the social butterfly on the team. So it's guys like that to me that uh, that I think about the most that I've been around. Nico was actually in town. Said he was he liked the lakes better than the ocean which he's more familiar with. So you've got both in Louisiana. Are you a lake or an ocean person? person? Uh, I'm not. 
I'm not too much of either. I'm not a big beach guy or an ocean guy. If you, I guess I would say I'm a lake guy uh, or a pond guy because you see <laughs> on the golf course. But if I could uh, get to on Pebble Beach, uh, I'd be more of an ocean guy because I'd like to be a Peninsula Bay, you know, playing that course. But yeah, I'm more of that. I, I'm I'm more inclined to head to the golf course than I ever would be skiing or on a beach or fishing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I would say more lake guy. I want to, I want to shift a little bit from players that have recruited to maybe have been fundamental shifts in the direction of a program by attending that school. And I've got one that I'm going to throw at you at Tennessee. Um, but I want to remind you, this is brought to you chalk talk brought to you by uh, our friends at the mattress place right there on Chapman Highway, right there with an incredible selection. And they can uh, certainly take care of you. They've got all the biggest brands and they've got a 5,000 square foot showroom with over 50 models. So uh, get to the mattress place. They've got the memory foam. They've got it all. But I'll tell you one guy that I thought was a major shift in the direction of Tennessee's program. And I think Peyton Manning gets a lot of credit for this, but I really go back and I think it was Heath Shuler. Now recruiting wasn't what it was back then or wasn't what it is back then. Okay. So we did, you know, you you knew Heath Shuler was pretty talented. I still think he could have won the decathlon in the Olympics. I think he was that good of an overall athlete. I I told him that I recruited him in high school, by the way. Oh, okay. Right. Bryson city, North Carolina, not very long because he wasn't interested in coming down to LSU, but, but uh, I remember him Bryson city, North Carolina. I remember that. Remember watching the tape? Remember talking to him on the phone? But go ahead. Yeah. He could he could have won the decathlon. Had he trained since he was 10 years old? Do you have any doubt of that? I thought he was a great all-around athlete. He was a phenomenal athlete. In the high school tape, it was just ridiculously good. And it was like, man, this guy could play another position. Big enough, athletic enough. And to your point, this – you could say that about a lot of the quarterbacks athletically today. You couldn't say that a lot then. A no. lot of it were pocket guys. And I was like, man, this guy's, I mean, this guy's not going to stay in a pocket. He's really athletic. He's, I mean, he's just, you know, is it really interesting? But uh, we never really got far enough into that discussion because it was pretty early. It looked like, um, you know, Clemson wasn't what Clemson is now as a recruiting force. Uh, it was pretty early, uh, like, you know, I'm going to spend my time more in other areas because he was headed to Knoxville, I could tell, pretty early. And Chalk Talk brought to you by the Mattress Place on Chapman Highway. I still go back, and I, I'm i not knocking the Jeff Francis's of the world and the Andy Kelly's of the world. I'm not. But I just thought when Heath came in, they were at a different level at quarterback. And then that opened the door for more guys to come in that – maybe in an indirect way because the way they utilize his abilities, which were way really different than Peyton's opened the door for more quarterbacks. Come in. I just, I thought he really transformed the program even before Peyton Manning did and their run of success. Well, I can remember Peyton's recruiting. I'd gotten in the NFL by then, but I remembered following it pretty closely. Um, obviously I knew Cooper um, who now has his son going to, to college at Texas, um, and, and Peyton as freshman. And uh, you can remember him being really good, like the more than just Archie's sons are playing ball, they've got a chance to be really good as freshman. And then I'd gotten in the NFL and I followed it. And, and, uh, obviously Peyton was looking at a lot of places and, um, but I, what I remember most about that was the supreme confidence that Tennessee had in them, the Tennessee staff, Phillip, um, Cutcliffe, when you were hearing a lot of things about where he could go and couldn't go, Tennessee never flinched. It was like they knew he was coming to Tennessee. I don't know if, if he gave them that or they was just being bravado confidence, but they never flinched. They thought they were getting him all along not a shadow of a doubt, no doubt, whatever, you know, 
but that was interesting. And I do think the, the the, and I think you're bringing up some really good points, the success of the program, but also I think Cutcliffe and how he was going to coach him. That's a big, big part of it. Like I think even in the next generation, I mean, certainly uh, Eli was Cutcliffe too. So if they had that in common, who coached him, but I think, who was going to coach Arch kind of filtered down to that. That's a biggest, a bigger part of anything. Now he, he wasn't going to get him to go to Duke if cut was still cut. I mean, that wasn't going to be the case, but you had to be the right type. And that was what sold Arch to Texas is Steve Sarkeesian. If Steve Sarkeesian was still at Alabama, he would have ended up at Alabama. I mean, you know, Arch. So, I think that was a big part of it. So I think the fact that the program at Tennessee was on the rise and you had cut and how we're, this is what we're going to do and it being a dyed-in-the-wool football guy, seeing it on tape and understanding how he was going to fit and how he was going to be taught. And the biggest thing was Peyton was always worried about that he couldn't run. He was always sensitive to that. And, his, and Cutcliffe, always taught the jab step if you ever saw you saw many of practices what did they do in individuals the quarterbacks all tap the ground like they're killing ants on the field yeah. and would you always hear oh he's got happy feet that is a particular jab step that Cutcliffe teaches so even if you're not real athletic if your feet are in constant movement uh for those of us that are watching us live your feet are constantly moving. It's easier to be able to turn and alter your shoulders than from a static position. And he told him, he says, I can help your footwork. It won't be a problem for you. And I can show you how. And and that was a big part of the selling point. So that was big. I give you a guy that had a tremendous impact on Tennessee's program, in my opinion, in terms of the leadership, the alpha dog leader, and the guy that was – you know, he kept the locker room in order, and he really, when he met with the recruit on campus, it was like an authority figure, and that was Al Wilson. I thought Al had a, a real big impact as a leader. I mean, he was a storm the hill, plant the, the flag type of guy for Tennessee that meant a tremendous amount for that program and tremendous amount in getting those defensive guys to come and to stay in line. And some of those guys were that were, were wild hairs, not mention any names, Albert Haynesworth, but that he got those guys to get to do what they were supposed to do, even though sometimes Albert needed to be corralled and, 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 and other guys like that. But anyway. Yeah, I think Al's right up at the top uh, as far as leader leaders that I've ever seen in, in any sport. He's a great radio interview. You just have to tape it because you have to go through and cur uh, cut out all the curse words. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, he's really – that and Doug Atkins are the two. Oh, my. I had an opportunity to get, uh, interview Doug Atkins. And it was like 40 minutes. He loved talking about Hallis and back in the days. And I'm just sitting there wide eyed, you know, I'm probably in my late thirties and just uh, blown away by this conversation I'm having with Doug Atkins. But I bet it was 40 minutes and the two different 20 minute parts. And by the time we cut out all the curse words, it was probably two 10 minute segments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But the stories of him shooting pigeons in Wrigley field before a game, with That's, a twenty-two, it's pretty classic. I, I, I haven't heard that, but it it, it makes it makes sense. He, back in those days, uh, at Wrigley Field, <laughs> George Hallis would have his players. You know those, you know, uh, like in an assembly, you have those steel chairs. You know, everybody has those. You know, in high school, there were steel chairs. You you know, you fold up and put. Uh, George Hallis, who was the owner and the coach of the Bears, he'd have his players before the game put the steel chairs out because those were like prime seats that they could sell for at that time. It was probably like eight bucks or something. You know, that was like expensive. Um, there was all sorts of things there with George Hallis. It's just, oh, I bet he's got some great Hallis stories. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, just incredible. I can remember the, the quick, quick one that, 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 that George Hallis, um, 
uh, Dit Buckus comes in and uh, wants to negotiate a new contract. And he says, Dick, you're, you're a great player. He says, he says, but people don't come to see you. They come to see Gail Sayers. And so, you know, Dick walks out and he accepts what he offers. Gail Sayers comes in, wants his new deal. Oh, no. And Judge Alice says, Gail, you're a great player. But people don't come to see you. They come to see Dick Buckus. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely- and and and, and uh, the Ditka had the famous line, and people thought after he said this, you know, as a player, and Ditka went. Ditka was a little bit later, and he left Chicago to go to Dallas to play it's tight end. And uh, Ditka says, "Yeah, Hallis throws around <laughs> quarters like manhole covers." I mean, you know, he says he's. he's and he, and he kind of, the relationship was bad, but as we all know, Hallis eventually hired Ditka to be the coach down the road. But he had to he kinda had to make a, amends because he said that to the press, which you really didn't do back in those days. No, you didn't. And Doug Atkins said some things that you really didn't say publicly. Oh, I, I mean, you talk about a guy who's calling out big-time names like the, you know, uh, Paul Brown's of the world, just calling out these big names. But he's got the gravitas to be able to do it. He's got the – he's allowed to – I can't. I mean, I'm just a dude. But uh, he he was that dominant of a figure. One of the all-time too. great. What a – Doug Atkins, what a great, great player. Great, great Tennessee volunteer. I would give a pinky toe to find that audio, and I kid you not, um, because I'm missing one pinky toe, and really, they don't help that much. Uh, the mattress place is where you need to go. They have a 5,000 square foot showroom with over 50 models. You can see them right here on their Facebook page, or you can click on mymattressplace.com, uh, where comfort meets affordability. That's the mattress place they also have printable coupons if you want to go to mymattressplace.com selection is absolutely unparalleled for chris landry go to landryfootball.com to learn more about football than you ever thought you could know i'm dave hooker this has been a presentation of off the hook sports